let's begin our discussion on invertebrate pests in the landscape. Here we're talking about bugs. And oftentimes people think about insects as being the primary group of bugs that eat your plants. And in this case, we wanna be general. So we're going to just use the term invertebrate, which means anything without a backbone or a little bit more accurately, arthropods, which is the scientific classification of insects and all the other creepy crawlies. So here we go with invertebrate pest ID and life cycle. So first let's discuss the types of damage that invertebrates can cause. And primarily this is done by feeding or eating your plants. The bugs will eat your plants. And they do so in one of two ways. Either they chew the leaves, they'll chew the different parts of your plants, or they will have mouth parts that enter your plant and can suck out the juices. So those invertebrates with chewing mouth parts, those are your caterpillars that eat your leaves. They can also put holes in flowers, in fruit, or even into the twigs of your plants. There are also some pests that bore into or tunnel inside of trees and shrubs and can hurt uh, plants from the inside. And finally, you can also have chewing pests down at the root zone and uh, they can be damaging the tree below the soil in a way that is hard to detect until you notice almost it's too late, you notice the damage up above. This contrasts with those invertebrate pests that have sucking mouth parts because those pests consume the plant fluid and they do not cut off the plant part. So the image on the right hand side shows a type of scale and that is a, a hard bodied insect that is uh, piercing into the twig and pulling out the sap or the juice from inside of the plant. And that is going to cause a different type of damage. Here, the damage that we see are the buds, the fruit, the leaves. They will discolor. They will distort or twist and curl up. And then finally, they can die back and even drop off from the plant. Additionally, some pests with sucking mouth parts will excrete a sticky honeydew. That's their waste product coming from out of the plant. And that honeydew will be uh, a place for other pathogens like sooty mold to attach. It's also what the ants are interested in when they bring the scale or the mealybugs or the aphids to your plant. Uh, and finally, some of the pests with sucking mouth parts will actually spread pathogens. They will be a vector for introducing new diseases. So let's talk about these invertebrates in greater detail and understand their uh, morphology and their life cycle. In general, we can broadly classify these as arthropods. That's the phylum that they're all placed in. And arthropods can be defined as invertebrates with exoskeletons, a segmented body, and jointed appendages. There are tons of them on Earth. And it's estimated that there are somewhere between one and 10 million species. That's a broad range because we have no idea how many there truly are on Earth. And in some parts of the world, you go out on a single night and you capture whatever uh, arthropods you can find, and you're guaranteed to find maybe 40% of them as species that are undescribed to science. Uh, currently, uh, we know that over 80% of all known living animal species are arthropods. So a great diversity and a great abundance of these creatures on Earth. And in general, they can all be characterized by a small size. Many of them fly. 
They tend to be highly adaptable to environmental changes. They go through mutations of one form or another, and they all have an exoskeleton. Now let's take a closer look at the body segmentation. Uh, insects are the ones that are probably most common to most people. They have three different body segments. They all have a head, then they have a thorax, and finally the abdomen. Arachnids only have two body segments. And within that, it's important to be able to kind of count or recognize these segments it helps you to narrow down the identification of the organism causing damage to plants. So that way you can uh, select appropriate control methods. Looking at the head, the head is where the eyes are. There can be somewhere between zero and five eyes. And those could be compound eyes that have multiple kind of little eyes within a single structure. It's also where the antennae are found and where the mouth parts are located. Then if we look at the thorax, this is typically three segmented. And after each segment, we're kind of like those stripes. Think about the different color stripes on a bee. Those are segments. So the thorax has three of them. And after each segment is a set of spiracles. Those are little holes where the organism breathes actually through the exoskeleton. The thorax is where all six legs on an insect will be attached to that center part. And there'll be the wings also on the thorax, usually one or two pairs of wings. And finally, we have the abdomen. This is where there are 11 segments and again, a pair of spiracles on each segment. And this is the tail end or the body portion where you would find the stingers or the ovipositors of various types of insects in particular. The exoskeleton is the cuticle. It's made out of chitin. Chitin is the same material that makes up your uh, hair and your fingernails. And it's a unique material in nature, uh, primarily produced by bugs, arthropods, insects, in the form of their exoskeleton. Not many things decompose chitin in the soil, and that's an important role of fungi, decomposing chitin, as well as the lignin from wood. The exoskeleton of the arthropods may have hairs. Those hairs are called setae. Those hairs can act as sensors to detect the air current or to detect contact touch. And some aquatic insects will use those even to trap air, little air bubbles that they can take down around their body as they descend underwater. There are muscles uh, attached to the inside of the exoskeleton. And this is how the organism flexes their limbs they may also use hydraulic pressure to do movement within the exoskeleton. When we look at the life cycle of arthropods and insects, they go through either uh, a complete or incomplete metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is uh, a change. And so if we first look at the incomplete metamorphosis, there are three primary stages. They start off in an egg, which is typically encased. Once the egg hatches, out comes a juvenile. And this juvenile is called a nymph. Uh, the reason it's called a nymph is because it looks exactly the same as the adult. It's just smaller. And as they grow, they will shed their exoskeleton. And a larger organism crawls out and they may go through several nymph stages, getting larger each time as they eat until they reach the final stage of their life cycle, which is an adult. And at this point, the primary goal of being an adult is reproduction, a mature adult. Many arthropods in the adult form don't even have a mouth because their only goal is to 
uh, reproduce and they're no longer looking for food. However, many adults still do have the ability to feed because that prolongs their life and enables them to have a higher chance of reproduction. So grasshoppers are a good example of uh, an insect that goes through incomplete metamorphosis. We can contrast this to complete metamorphosis where there are four stages. And again, the organism starts out in an egg and then hatches as a larva. Now the larva is the grub or the caterpillar or the maggot, depending on if you're talking about beetles, um, moths and butterflies or flies, there's different terms, but it kind of looks like a little worm. The primary job of the larva is to eat and they often eat quite a bit. They're very uh, hungry caterpillars. And next they form a pupa. And this is where the organism uh, kind of goes into a resting period where it will uh, change from the larva to the adult. And so this would be the cocoon of the butterfly, for example. And then finally emerges the adult. And here again, the primary purpose is reproduction although many adults will still feed as well. It's important to understand the life cycle of the organism causing problems in your landscape because you can implement various strategies for the various stages. It could be that only the larval stage of the organism is problematic and even that adult of the same species could be beneficial. So timing, and control methods become very important as we observe the various life cycle stages of the organism in question. Now, in general, we can break down the arthropods into smaller categories, the class of the taxonomy scale. And let's just take a quick overview of some of the primary arthropods that we see in the landscape. We'll start with arachnids. Arachnids are the spiders, basically. They have eight legs, they live mainly on land, and they comprise over 100,000 named species. These include spiders, harvestmen, scorpions, ticks, and mites. And the mite is the one on the bottom left-hand side, but they all have eight legs, and they're all considered arachnids. It's important to differentiate the arachnids from the insects, for example, because usually we like the spiders in the garden. We may not like the mites as if they're not decomposers, but they're plant pests. But we could select strategies that would favor or discourage arachnids individually and not hurt the rest or not go for the broad spectrum uh, strategies. Then we have myriapoda, and this includes the millipedes and the centipedes. Uh, millipedes have two pairs of legs on each body segment. They are poisonous, meaning if you eat them, you will be poisoned. They're usually slow moving and they are detritivores, meaning they're decomposers. They eat decomposing plant material. Centipedes, on the other hand, they have one pair of legs per body segment. They are venomous, meaning they inject the poison when they bite. They are typically fast moving and they are the carnivores of the arthropod world. Both of these are good to see in the garden. They're decomposing organic material and the centipedes will be eating plant pests. So you don't have to worry about either of these. It's just part of the rich diversity of the landscape. And next we have insects. These are very common to most people. They contain six legs, compound eyes, and one pair of antennae. This is the most species rich member of all ecological guilds. And insects may be found in a wide variety of environments, including polar ice caps, oil slicks, salt water, thermal pools, hot desert sands, 
there's virtually no place on earth where you cannot find insects. Here again, we have insects that are plant pests, and we have those insects that are predators. Next, we have the beetles. The beetles are a very diverse group. There are many, many species of beetles on Earth. And one of the things that uh, characterizes a beetle is that the front pair of wings is hardened into a wing case. So that thick armor shell of the beetle uh, is actually a wing. And in order for the beetle to fly, that armor shell folds up and then the second set of wings can fold out, and usually with some sort of uh, liquid or hydraulic pressure, they expand, they can flap around, and then they'll fold in, and the, the wing case will then cover up the wings once again. Uh, a great diversity of beetles in our world, some of them plant pests, some of them predators. Next, we have diptera. These are the true flies, and these include blowflies, mosquitoes, and hoverflies. Flies have a single pair of wings with which to fly. They have a mobile head. They can look around, and they have a pair of large compound eyes and mouth parts that are designed for piercing and sucking. And then we have hymenoptera. These are the wasps, bees, and ants. Here, the females typically have a special ovipositor for inserting eggs into hosts or otherwise inaccessible places. And this would be the case for wasps. Now, the ovipositor is often modified into a stinger, as we see with bees. And then you can think about ants. And you may not consider ants to be very closely related to bees and wasps. However, if you examine the morphology or the shape of the body, you can see some clear similarities. And the ants do not have wings. However, some ants, some of the times, do emerge with wings. And in this case, they would show a much more close similarity. And also, again, we have uh, hymenoptera who are beneficial in the landscape. They do pollination. They do uh, parasitization. They'll go after your plant pests, or they can be problems in and of themselves. And then finally, we have Lepidoptera. These are the moths and the butterflies. And it's usually the case that the larval form of the organism, the caterpillar, is the one that causes uh, plant problems, excessive feeding, for example. And the adult is usually not a problem. In fact, they can be beneficial if they do any form of pollination. And remember that we want to treat all organisms with proper respect and care, and we don't want to damage any species to the point where their population is threatened on Earth. We want to prevent extinctions. So there are a lot of efforts to try to protect certain subcategories of these uh, arthropods, for example, the monarch butterfly. And uh, the caterpillar eating the milkweed uh, is actually a prized activity that gardeners want to have happen. And so it's not that all feeding even is bad. Sometimes we put things out there just to be food for the organisms because we want to respect and enhance wildlife with our gardens. So there we go with just a brief overview of arthropods or invertebrates, their general life cycle, their general damage categories that they can do to plants, how to identify them based on some basic morphological structures, and then how to examine them in their different taxonomical categories. In future weeks, we will look at these in greater detail and discuss the control strategies for invertebrate pests.